let's do some recap re reflection of, of, of the, the exercise uh, you had last week. Uh, and, uh, and, and first of all, it was uh, the purpose of the exercise uh, was to get experience uh, on, on, on the deliberate role taking and positioning you, yourself as a helper and listener and also as, 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 as a client and, and a coachee. So that, that, that's kind of uh, one part of, of, of facilitation uh, that you, you realize that you have to take a role and, and position yourself uh, within that role in, in an appropriate way. And, and so it's it's not kind of uh, this kind of uh, equal roles as, as such. Uh, and then, of course, on, on, on reflective conversation, meaning that that, that it's, it's kind of allowing the client to, to reflect on the, his or her experience and, 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 and uh, asking a good question to, to allow, allow uh, help the other person make, make meanings, make sense out of the experience. And of course, but as uh, experience on on listening, so that that uh, that you you really concentrate on other person's talk, allow him or her to to create a space through your own listening that other can can uh, have an opportunity to talk, uh, and then on helpful relating, so that that how we can uh, be helpful. Uh, the, the other person that he or she can can make sense, and so that's that's very essence of of the, all this this as we discussed last week uh, this kind of helpful relations. Uh, so for, and of course there is techniques, good questions, how to keep the balance and 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 keep a stance, how to encounter others, also the, the emotional stuff and 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 so forth. Uh, and then your reports. Uh, there's a lot of fascinating learning and experience stories. And, and so it was really, uh, as you mentioned, that uh, overall, I, I think most, most of you felt, as, or all those I, I, I read, uh, the exercise was, was, was useful. There were some points that, okay, that was uh, uh, not just a total disaster or, or such. Uh, and, and, and some mentioned that it, it was even, even fun to do. Uh, and, and, and there was some amazement uh, how, how just 15 minute dialogue can make a difference. That you can, you can have a relatively short moment where you can really experience this kind of presence and, and, and to get to, that you, you were heard, that it, you were allowed to talk about your own, uh, own, own stuff. And also uh, other way around that, that, that uh, being able to, to concentrate on that listening uh, and and then it was also mentioned that that it's it's not just the words it's 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 quite a bit being present hearing the whole person. Uh, and 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 so that was that was very very nicely reported. Some of you have also wrote the the, the content, but but uh, it was nice to read also those. But but I think it it, it was the point to really reflect on the experience. How was how was it, and and uh, it was very nicely, it was nice nicely written, and of course there was also uh, some challenges that was there was very exp experienced, uh, so listening deliberately and and focused uh, so that that it's it's really a uh, so how to keep curious here and now stands that uh, we we really. Uh, uh, concentrate on on what what the, what the other person is talking, having the other feeling, the ha having that feeling that now I'm I'm allowed to to talk, and this 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 moment is just for me. Um, and of course, it, it's it's it it was when you are in this kind of equal situation that you both have same experience, but it was reflected on. Then of course it's it's quite natural that there is this that you you want to share I have the same or okay I I had a little bit different here uh, and uh, and and it, it was it was good that you 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 noticed this moment when it was really you were willing to say uh, about your own experience hearing that and 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 really how to not start sharing your own experience 
or give advice because it was all, all it, but and that's that's now one of the essence uh when we want to learn this that that we we can uh really actively uh concentrate on that that that, that in that role that we are just listening and concentrating on that asking more about that and, and putting aside our experience. But of course, that can be also a resource sometimes. And, and we can in coaching or this kind of helping relations, of course, not just we, we draw totally, but, but sometimes, okay, I, I used to have this experience. How, is there anything that was related to your experience here? And, and so it, it, it can be used as a resource. But falling out of role and, and starting to take a stage and okay I have this and that and blah 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 and so that's that's to be the cost of it and of course it's it's now uh same thing in other roles as, as a leader uh sometimes it's it's good to uh really to keep keep the role and 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 being able to be there and notice that, that okay now I would like to share this but is is it now appropriate and of course, then uh, uh, maybe it could be uh, some uh, some of you are experienced in this coaching and, and facilitation already, uh, and and so it was a very good good points also raised that that there could be more uh, more more advice, more instruction, more more ideas. Uh, what kind of questions uh, is to be asked? So open questions, what are the open questions and so forth. And maybe here there could have been a little more structure given. So how to start and, and what that, what could be the questions. But of course, I, I we also want space for you to, to explore what will emerge and, and, and how to have a good reflective talk. Uh, on, on, on your experience. But that's, I think, very, very important part also learning to be helpful. So what kind of question I can ask? And sometimes it's good to ask really open questions that it, it really leaves space for others to choose. And so, uh, so I have some own instructions who are very just uh, raising your eyebrows was a, was a kind of question. <laughs> okay. And then, then it was kind of invitation to continue or make sense what you just said. And so, uh, and, and sometimes it can be that just repeat the word. I have a problem here. Okay, problem. And and then the other, it's kind of invitation. So, and then sometimes it can be more focused, but basically open questions are good. Uh, some further points. So in basically the facilitator really create a space, safe space for the client. And so this psychological safety is, is important here. And one thing I, I tend to forget, and it's very crucial here, and, and some, some raised that as well, uh, is concerning this creating a safe space, is that all coaching discussion, that's kind of facilitation discussion concerning uh, personal stuff and, and this kind of private uh, setup is confidential. And that's good to say, in 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 all setting and and I'm I'm sorry for not uh, raising this up last time enough and and maybe if not at all because that's that's really a, a important to 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 remember because that's that's one thing that I I have a safe feeling to share here and I'm going to trust that is not told further uh, and and so but uh, that's the in a way basic mechanism that that. Uh, Facilitator coach enablers a safe space for 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 a group or a community or or, or a person to talk and reflect, uh, and and uh, feeling that I can I can also show my vulnerability or my my uncertainties or, or my my uh, certain certain emotions that are about about this uncertain, and then it's it's an experience of appreciation competence uh, feeling involvement progress uh, in a way that 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 uh, the the facilitator can enable and, and it's always kind of unique moment and so uh, and and then to really having a good tools having a, all these structures are very good but remembering that it's it's always uh, a special moment uh, uh, where we the 
most of all, I think the, uh, maybe the, I have a little bias here, but I believe that this quality of relationship is, is much more important. And that's based on some, some uh, impact research as well, that, that in, 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 in the quality of uh, relation, the help and relations is much more important than just the method. And uh, that, uh, uh, and so you can use a variety of methods, but having a, this kind of good relationship and, and creating that within the group as well is 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 uh, important. So and uh, of course this was very short little exercise uh, and and uh, uh, we really encourage you to take opportunities and find opportunities to really experience experiment experiment this this the different uh, ways of being having good conversations helping in, in this helping situation as well so and through this experiential stuff you learn and and can fine tune your own style to being a facilitator uh, and of course willing to be helpful uh, and helpful in that way that you don't give advice or tell. So it, 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 in a way that that it's 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 really uh, this kind of empowering or 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 emancipating way of of helping where other really feel that okay now I now I I, I can I can handle this thing or have have a feeling of efficacy. So maybe with these words uh, and of course we have this meta 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 stuff here because you you reflect in your own course experience and some of some some wrote about that that well it was a good recap so you have to go went through that what have what have i learned so far and 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 that was that was on purpose so that you you had a mo moment to 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 keep up what what has happened on a course and how you have worked and and, and what have what have you uh, achieved so far but I, I guess that was that was my my points. But th thanks for for your your submissions. Okay, Christ, are you ready to with your slides now? I am ready. Yes. Okay. Uh, as a tip for everyone, it, it's it's really good to put your slides in Google Drive or something similar, so you can go to the older versions. This totally saved me today. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I was just listening to your recap and and thinking here that. It's this facilitation as a skill is, is kind of interesting because you can be actually very junior. You don't have to be uh, yeah. you don't have to be that old or you know you can be a very young person and still be able to facilitate uh, just by looking at kind of the points that you are actually curious. You you of course you need to be a little bit you, you need to ask questions and you need to be somehow kind of confident. I'm sure everybody understands yeah. what I mean and a little bit. Yeah, and uh, and it was nice to read also that there were many when there was this senior junior kind of uh, setups in these pairs that that uh, that our our students were really really felt that to be a, a good good in facilitation such even uh, if, if there's not not that much experience than than the uh, more more senior people and so I, I really liked that yeah. Uh, excellent. I just remember there's a Groucho Mark saying something about explaining it to a five-year-old, but can't remember. I'll, 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 I'll get it later, but kind of the point that, you know, actually very junior people, kids have really good questions. And if you're trying to explain <laughs> complex things to kids, then yeah, that's not, that's a nice challenge. Indeed kind of like yeah try to explain to your kids what do you do at work well that is in the garage talking to people and they're like Shh. okay uh yes uh apologies Yara, your line was a little bit not as best today but uh, the, i mean the the connection but mm. i think everybody got the point anyway so nothing dramatic there yeah, hopefully. unlike yeah. my slides that totally broke apart anyway based on that so what about Today's theme, what about face-to-face -face group work and tools? Today's theme is really before the break is tools, a couple of tools, and I definitely take them from kind of design tools, 
just view, but but also strategic thinking. You'll see when I come over there. It's not saying these are the tools, but I'm pretty sure that you will probably end up looking at these kind of tools and similar tools. And really the focus on facilitation, just like we have been talking, it's a, it's a different thing if you are facilitating somebody than if you are the one who actually needs to get things done. These are different roles and they can be a little bit blended and you can play with them to be separate. And kind of the tools that will, the, the ones that we're gonna go through here, uh, mostly because of my own background, so I feel very confident about talking them. But remembering from the very first lecture when we talked about these certain tools, mainly you know design tools, agile, lean tools, customer journeys, and all of these value proposition right there in the middle. Just reminding that we have these tools and you most probably need somebody to facilitate other people to use them in the beginning. So that's really the perspective of today. And, and to put another way, if you want people to start using new tools, you probably need somebody. You need a midwife or a facilitator here. You need somebody to help others give birth to a better business model, to give birth to a better design or whatnot. So that's really the mindset. I think uh, another metaphor for facilitation is you as the midwife, because like in this picture, it's obvious. And, and even if you haven't been present at childbirth, except your own, but you probably don't remember. Uh, the thing is that as a midwife, you understand that, yes, this is actually a super important skill, ability, role. But at the end of the day, it's really the other people delivering their baby. It's not your baby, literally. But you do understand and see that this process of childbirth probably would benefit if there's a professional facilitator here. And sometimes, you know, given this metaphor, people go like, well, but I'm not an external facilitator. You know, what if, what if, I, what if I'm the project manager and I need to facilitate my project members? What if I'm the boss and I need to facilitate my, the people working for me? Uh, I, I can, I, how can I be the midwife? This midwife thing doesn't work for me. Well, why not? Why not take that angle? Try it out. Isn't your job as the PO, as the boss, as the supervisor, isn't your job at the end of the day to help others succeed? Isn't you know the company to succeed, the organization to succeed? So you're kind of actually, this whole facilitation is much more closer to you perhaps than you realize. And this all goes to the big discussions as a you know leader, as a servant kind of thing, that the leadership is all about serving others. And that's really this facilitation midwife angle works there. It's really how do you help others to succeed? And if you don't still believe this, then try it out. Take this angle, take this approach and see how things might go different. Good. So facilitation and tools. Step number one, know your toolbox and methods. So this is kind of the obvious thing that whatever tools you have in your toolbox or in your garage, hey, there's plenty of tools there on the shelf. You probably should understand what tools a little bit more deeper. Otherwise you're gonna just be gonna be using them uh, without really knowing where they come from. Why is this method? What's the point of this whole method? So you can be like a zombie facilitator and saying that we're gonna use a business model canvas uh, I don't really know why the business model canvas is the right tool for this moment, but we were just told to use the business model canvas. So first of all, looking at any method, not just these tools or methods, it's really good to keep in mind that tools are not just for doing. We kind of think that if we have a tool, do I have a tool here? Oh, we have a tool here. We have a spoon. Spoon is definitely a tool. <laughs> The tools, this is definitely for, you know, taking food and putting it into your mouth. That's a tool for doing. But actually, there's many more dimensions to tools as well. And the first step is to understand. And here I have divided into four dimensions, especially if you take facilitation tools like a business model canvas or a customer journey or so forth. Tools are also for communication, for research, for engaging others. And yes, 
typically tools are also for doing, getting things done. Let's quickly look what I mean by this. So the first of all, if you look at the toolbox you have, your personal toolbox, the kind of tools you typically like to use, you know, whether they are a you know, computer system or a canvas or on a board or a workshopping method or something like that you're, you're familiar with. You can look at the same tool and look at what's the communication. How much is how much is this tool actually about communicating? That if we use this tool, is it to sell ideas, to make good arguments for decisions, to clarify complex things for others? But let's do the business model canvas so we can actually start understanding what's happening here and just bringing order to chaos. That is very much a communication thing. And if we look at a couple of tools I've listed here, customer journey, service blueprints, business model canvas, personas tool from design, how might we sentences, kind of these typical videos, they are actually very much about communicating, trying to tell others what is going on, trying to clarify things. And I guess the sparring question is, if you have a tool that you're going to use and you're asking yourself, is this for, you know, is this for communication? Can you see what's the communication value of this tool? The, the question is, if I was all alone in this project, if this was a one person project, would I use this tool? If you feel that you don't need it, then probably the tool would have a lot of communication value. If you're just one person, you don't need to communicate things to others. So that was dimension number one. Tools are for communication quite often. Then tools are actually for a lot of our researching. Remember, this is kind of the other dimensions, not just for doing, not just for communication, but actually a lot of tools will help you gather information and data. And a lot of them are about analyzing the data, analyzing the knowledge. We did all of these interviews and now we need to put them into a context. So let's use this mapping tool, like a customer map and put this data into the context and analyze it. And a lot of the tools are about understanding the current situation. And uh, especially like interviewing design tools, if you think about them, they are about gathering information or eliciting information that is not obvious. How do people feel about these things? And, and what do they actually think that they're not saying aloud? And there's a list of tools that are very much about researching, getting more information and data. And the kind of the sparring question for these tools is that if I knew enough, if I knew everything about this domain or enough about this domain, would I use this? And if the answer is no, I don't need this, then you kind of understand that this tool is actually would bring you more research and more data. Then the third dimension is the engagement. And this I'm sure you all understand who have been using these in a group. And you actually need tools to get other people involved. So let's say you have a group of people and you really want everybody's opinion. You actually probably need some kind of a method or a tool to make sure that everybody's heard, that everybody has the time to give their views on these. Maybe the method is as simple as let's go one by one around the room and listen what everybody has to say. Or maybe it's an open, you know, open text box in a web where people can write anonymously what they think about. Maybe that's your tool or method. But the thing is, you probably need people to contribute. You could get everybody's opinion. You might be in a situation like that. And how do you get all those different diverse perspectives? And because you want the richness, you want the knowledge, but also the fourth one over here, you actually want people to engage so they feel ownership, that they feel that this project is, you are part of the project. You know, we're listening to you. You, you are committed into this. You believe in in this, you can you can shape things. It becomes more meaningful. So actually, brainstorming, in my opinion, we often think that it's for generating ideas, but actually, brainstorming, you know, the one where you put post-its on a wall and have wild and crazy ideas, it's actually very much about engaging people. I wouldn't count on the ideas being the solution as such. But I would use brainstorming to get people involved, to get different kind of opinions, to get the perspective and engage people. So my sparring question is, if all my coworkers were machines, so not humans, would I use this? Uh, because 
you need if you have people working with you you need somehow to engage them somehow get their input energy and commitment so you probably need tools for that and then last but not least of course you have your tools for doing stuff uh, and here you can start thinking tools can be different you know taking the design further you know make making progress with the project or maybe this is a tool where I can chop things into smaller pieces and then do them one by one. Maybe it's a checklist of, of have you thought about this and this and this and this. And those are things that actually are you doing the work, taking it forward. And prototyping, I think, is an obvious example of it. And maybe the sparring question is that if you know, if you don't have to take things forward, if you're giving a presentation, if you're trying to sell your concept then you probably don't need tools that help you get things done. You probably need tools that are really good at communication. Now, if we put all of these together, kind of the different dimensions of a method or a tool, it looks probably like this, that we have the doing part, the researching part, communication part, and the engaging part. And if you remember them, the previous lectures, you can see that there's this participation reification again the tools can be actually really good at the participation, reification, the meaning making as well as researching and doing, which are, you know, probably typically what we think tools and methods are good for. So know your tools, understand, look at your tools, understand that there are different dimensions and different uses for tools, and they're not all about doing or researching. It's very much about communication. Good, second point, how do you help others to use the tools? Because probably you know, you have your favorite tools. Maybe you're really good at the business model canvas. Maybe you're really good at the lean canvas. Maybe you're really good at doing this and this design prototyping. But if you're a facilitator, that's not enough really. No, you need the others to understand that as well. Otherwise, you become the bottleneck. If you're the only one who knows how to do this, it doesn't really scale up now, does it? And that's really the difference between a facilitator and a solo artist. A solo artist does everything by themselves. A facilitator is all about others succeeding. So again, just reminding my experience really comes from service design tools, agile, you know, teamwork and all of that. And maybe perhaps because I was involved in building a whole toolbox that really colors my way of thinking. But I'm thinking here a little bit more generally to help you out. Uh, so I have kind of th three themes, I think. And in my experience as a facilitator for over 10 years, is that these are typically things that people need facilitation with. And uh, I'll go th through them quickly. So the three things are strategic answers. Those strategic questions are easy, but answering is not. Customer perspective, that's a classic. People think that they understand the customer perspective, but do they really? And the last one is really about ideation and coming up with different concepts. Again, that's something we think that, hey, coming up with ideas is easy. Sure, it is easy, but coming up with something actionable, not that easy. So let's go. Let me check the clock. Here we go, no problem. The first theme about facilitating others about the strategic thinking. And surprise, surprise, I've been talking about this many lectures already, because the thing is that you actually facilitate people to have clear objectives. So think about strategy. Strategy is something that how do we get from A to B? And the B is typically the objectives. So actually, uh, strategy, once you should have relatively good or actually as good as you can get the objectives, the B, and you should have something to A and the strategies from getting A to B. So the importance of having those clear objectives is already have the strategy. And like it says, yes, yes, it's all, always about the objectives. Uh, like I said, asking, Strategic questions is relatively easy. Answering strategic questions is difficult. But you know what is the most difficult part? 
Well, it says right there in the slide, writing down strategic answers is even more difficult. And this we have been actually made you do already a couple of times. It's quite easy to say that, oh yeah, yeah, this is our objective. But when somebody asks you, can you please write it down? And you go like, then you actually need to start thinking about what's the wording? If I write it like this, what does it mean? And then you can take frameworks like the DOM framework and try to make the text and the writing down even better. And you all know by now that this is not actually easy. You thought that the objective was clear, but once you start writing it down, showing it to others, making sure that it's doable, understandable, measurable and beneficial, it becomes a bit difficult. So as a facilitator, my tips are here. So balancing people's answers. Uh, people typically give you broad answers. So what's the strategic purpose? It can be right, but well, it's to help the Finnish nation. Well, that's a bit broad now, is it? Uh, probably, you're probably right, but can you narrow it? But not again, not have, having people to let narrow it too specific. So as a facilitator, you'll probably find yourself balancing between two broad answers to two narrow things. And that's the conversation you're having with people. Uh, you probably should have some examples as answers. Don't have to be that topic. You can say, well, you know, last year I was in this project and they, they had this goal and this is the way they wrote it down. And then show them literally a good written down objective or an answer to strategic question. Then a couple of facilitation tricks, listening to people, summarizing it back. When they say something, you go like, huh, okay. So what you are saying is this, and then you kind of say it back to them and they listen to them and they go like, yeah, except that now we should add this and this, or now I realize that it's too narrow. You know, a basic trick. And the last tip I have about answering strategic questions is quick role plays. So typically I like the one where I say that, hey, let's imagine that the chief financial officer Talousjohtaja in Finnish, that he or she is coming over here and you need to explain to them what you are doing. How would you, what would you say? Or another one is that, you know, your key, key client is coming here. How would you explain it to them? So this very quick, like a role place that they have a very specific person and they need to clarify the objectives or their answers to them. That helps quite a lot. And then you can take the facilitation from there. The other typical problem about strategic questions is that often the decision maker is not there, that the, the boss or the boss of the boss is not there. And people are like, well, we can't move forward. We need to get the bigger boss over here. But actually you can. Well, first of all, <laughs> try to get the person there. If you know that this coming workshop is about this and this topic, maybe you can already see that I should probably schedule the bigger boss to visit for 15 minutes or half an hour. Uh, but if you can't do that afterwards, then do it immediately. And then maybe you just park the whole thing. Okay, let's put this on the shelf. Let's schedule a meeting with the boss tomorrow and let's work on this other thing. And then the third one is that, okay, the decision maker isn't here now, but if you were the decision maker, what would you make the decisions? What would you say? And those are kind of your best guesses, your hypotheses. This is probably what the decision maker will tell us or say or ask. And you are actually taking things quite far away already. So don't let that stop you either. Then my last point about answering strategic questions is accountability. Uh, a couple of times I've been in a situation where I put a canvas on the wall Nowadays, you would put it in a mirror or mural, but you put a canvas on a wall and then people were like, hey, this is, yeah, let's answer this. And they're kind of having fun with it and laughing and maybe even having silly answers, uh, which is good. People are a bit relaxed, but they kind of think that this is just an exercise, that the real work happens somewhere else. Now we got this workshop, let's answer whatever it is. And then we leave for the real work that happens outside. And that's, of course, problem if you are doing real work in the workshop. And the word I use here is accountability. So how do we make sure what people write down and the answers they give 
are something that they're like, yeah, but you know, can you stand behind that answer of yours? And there are a couple of tricks that really work. Bring in real people, get the boss there. I'm sure if their boss is there or the business owner is there, they will be more serious. Bring real customers. You know, if they're saying that, ah, oh, we don't care about our customers, well, bring a physical real person in there and let's have a discussion with the customer. Let's see how it goes. Work on real cases. So you probably might have some exercises just to get to know the tool, but pretty quickly move on to real cases, real projects with real people involved. The third one is something, a little trick I've used a couple of times, is make them literally sign it. Let's say that they're answering the business model canvas and then like, can you sign your name underneath it that you stand behind all of these answers? And that's like a soft way of bringing up the fact that, hey, are you accountable? You know, do you take accountability for these answers? You didn't just mess around, that you're, you're really honest and you've done your best job. So the fourth one is pretty, uh, another trick is to make them present to the public. You know, that's why often in a workshop or a training, you have the other team present to others because then you get kind of social pressure and, and people take it a little bit more seriously. You know, they're very serious. So that was the first theme. Then the second one is facilitating the customer perspective, empathy and diversity. And I don't know how many of you have found out that you know seeing the other person's worldview is difficult. And this is something we already touched in the very first lecture. We have different lenses and how difficult it is to change the lenses and have those different perspectives. Empathy is actually very difficult. And there's a couple of tricks over here. Uh, like we typically, it's easy for us to answer the rational, let's say customer, the rational act actions of people. But let's write them down and then they are over there and we can go more to the emotional, the empathetic and the thinking part of these things. So let's get the rational out of the way. And like the third one says, bring in a real person, a real customer. That actually makes magic. When you start listening to a real person, empathy becomes much more easier when there's a real other person in the room. Another typical thing is saying, ah, all this customer stuff, that's, that's consumer business, but we are in the business to business world. It doesn't apply here. Well, that's just total bull, bull crap. <laughs> because I don't know if any of you work in a business to business scenario, but it's actually quite often that in a business to business world, it's more about face to face. It's more about, you know, having a person building a relationship to that person in the other company and doing business with them. So kind of the best customer centric people I have ever met are, you know, old school salespeople who are building these relationships year after year and understanding the other person and their needs and demands. And then Another way of thinking about the, bringing the customer perspective is that if people are very business and numbers oriented, then just use their language. You know, start talking about quantified business language because there are very customer centric concepts such as these in the, in the slide, customer lifestyle value, acquisition costs, uh, average revenues and you know, convert. These, these are actually very customer centric concepts if you think about them. Like, you know, conversion rates. It's all about how these people become our customers and what is the process. And if you really want to work on a good conversion rate, you nearly need to understand those people. And any business person understands all of these things and really understands the value of them. So kind of speak the business language. Uh, doesn't mean you have to become a business person. Of course, you should be or could be, but this is kind of building the bridges between the two. But make no mistake, uh, avoiding customers is super easy. Here I have my six good excuses. If you don't want to talk to customers, if you don't want a customer perspective, here you can pick any of those and just avoid customers for the rest of your career. Because these are very powerful excuses. Uh, 
fear of facing new people. Yeah, probably not not a good idea to talk to new people and, <laughs> or or not seeing the value of talking to customers. It's not data. It's not numbers. We're just listening to them. There's no point in it and so forth. And then last but not least, the third one is about ideation and concepts. A couple of points on, on that thing. Uh, first of all, maybe you already picked that I'm not a huge fan of ideas because I think ideas are easy to create. If I would take three of you randomly, lock you in a room for an hour, I'm sure you would come up with 300 ideas. Ideas are cheap. Ideas and the problem with ideas is they can be anything. They can be small things, large things, human things, technological things, business things. There's no, they, yeah, it can be anything. But actually, I'm a huge fan of value propositions because I think a value proposition is a better tool to communicate the things that ideas try to communicate. Because, like the value proposition canvas in this slide, the value proposition already implies that there's a relationship between a customer and a service or a product provider. It has a lot of things built into it. There's much more structure, much more boundaries than an idea. So don't get me wrong, I think ideation and brainstorming are good, but they're actually really good at engaging people. I don't think they are very effective with actually solving problems. If you have people who don't, <laughs> If you have people who don't come up with wild ideas, if you need to break the eyes, do brainstorming. But in my opinion, then move towards more effective concepting tools once you get the engagement up and running. And two other of my favorite tools are, or maybe it's a one tool that you can use it in two ways. I think customer journey is the super powerful, very rich tool that you can use in helping people come up with ideas or concepts because the customer journey just stretches things into a journey that our customers come from somewhere and there is this process because before they you know become our customers or advocates and you can use it as a conversion funnel the kind of examples i've been using our customers they come here this is how they become aware of our thing then they engage with it then they make a purchase decision then they use it and then they use it even more so that becomes kind of a conversion funnel. How do we, all the potential customers, how do we get the ones that are keep using our stuff all over again? And, and a customer journey has all in one. It's a communication tool. It's a very engaging tool if you use it like this. It's very good at research and it's very good at actually doing things. And you can use it in 20 minutes or you can use it in 20 days. So if you're not familiar with it, if you have never used it, it's a very super good tool to facilitate really rich customer understanding and you can use it in many ways so the previous example was really about customer you know funnel how do we get our customers but actually you can use it totally to understand the customers what is the journey they actually take not the journey they do in your business but let's say like you're traveling to travel you're traveling to spain in the summer well your customer journey is very different from the customer journey of the airline. So there's different things, but you can still take the same tool and look at how, what's kind of the empathies, what's the feelings, the emotions, all the service providers at different stages. So it's also a very powerful tool in that as well. And then the last one is the business model canvas. I think I'm a, I'm a big fan of this as well, because this really brings the business perspectives into the business model there's perspectives into it how does it actually work where does the money come from what's the value where are the revenues who are our partners and so forth i think it's always a very good question to ask that who will pay and what uh, but then maybe using the business model canvas is good to always to remember it's not the same as a building a business case typically if somebody's if you're facilitating people with a business model canvas, it's fairly good to understand that this is not building a business case whether we should do this or not. This is just you know flexing out what is the business model and its components. Good. Uh, yeah, that was a quick run, but you get the slides and you can look at the bullets if you found something that you want to think more about. Um, 
Okay, my final thing for today is to give you an example mm, of perhaps how to introduce things and thinking and concept when people are uh, to new people. Let's put it that way. And my example is something that I found myself doing quite a lot in the past past decade or so. And having my background in service design, I found and an educator, I find myself introducing service design thinking or design thinking into different workplaces and, and companies and to different people quite often. And this is really based on my experience in everything we I talked about earlier on, about introducing new things. So just maybe to make things a bit more concrete, I'm going to share you with this example. How do you introduce design thinking to non-designers? And your method is maybe it's an individual workshop or sprint. So maybe it's like a one day or let's say a five days. So I've done a couple of times these five day sprints of in different kinds of companies for people of how to come up with, how to introduce the design thinking. And the little kind of tongue in cheek over there is that in my experience, working working in a company full of designers, it's, <laughs> it's actually very difficult to introduce design to designers because of course designers have a very strong opinions that what it is all about and uh, not necessarily that open to questioning their their own ways of thinking and doing and it's not just about the designers i think anybody you know agree me or not uh in the chat but with these all these schools and all these mindsets uh they have a little baggage with them because they are sometimes you, you maybe find per people who are really like huge fans of agile and then other people are like oh that's a little bit too much for me not the agile but kind of the enthusiasm so i don't know maybe you say the word agile and people who are not software developers are like well oh, this is not for me that's it's that software development stuff or maybe you say the word business and then ah oh, i'm not a business person I'm, I'm, I'm a developer i'm a designer i don't this is not for me i can go away i can leave the breakout room or whatever and definitely with the word design causes allergic reactions to people. Somebody said the word design and, well, I'm not a designer. I'm an engineer. So it, it doesn't concern me. So the point being, and unfortunately, this is true in my experience, that people, people get allergic reactions into these things, even before listening what they are all about. Um, so how do you actually then facilitate design thinking if you need to avoid the D word? How do you do that? Well, the first question for, especially for all of us who are familiar with design thinking, or maybe you are a professional designer, is to think that what is it? What is design if you can't use the D word? And you probably come up with something like this, you know, add into the chat if you have other things that pop into your mind. But if you're trying to explain that, well, there's this, you know, avoid the D word. Talk about customer centricity, business and technology, creativeness, playfulness, being visual, collaboration, problem driven, iterative thinking. All of these things are actually inside the D word. So maybe, you know, start talking about this that, hey, what if, what if your team, what if our project, what if our company wants to be more customer centric or uh, what if we try to learn methods for better co-creation? Or how about these tools that really help us to be problem-driven or help us to be iterative? So that's kind of the first stop, stop, first step, if you will. So it's really about don't start with design thinking or whatever the word is, agile or a lean startup or, or so forth. Uh, the whole point is that you try to kind of introduce things and then let the people themselves find the thinking in their own terms. So rather than telling them that this is now something, you know, here it is, you should learn this and start learning. This is your answer. People, I think professionals, with all due respect, we're kind of like, ah, well, what is it? I don't know. But if you kind of start introducing it piece by piece with their own terms, then that's the point. So how do you do it? So asking yourself the question that being kind of very problem centric in this, that if you really believe that design or agile thinking or lean thinking 
is something that your company, your team should adopt. Then ask yourself, so what is actually the problem? If, if the solution is design thinking, and you're really convinced it is, then what is the problem that design thinking would solve? And then you're already on the path of understanding how you introduce this thinking. How do you facilitate people to take design thinking into account? And kind of my recipe for this is would start with the people and facilitating. The step one is surprise, surprise, clarify their own objectives together with them. Go to the problem, you know, what do you, dear people, what are the objectives you want to reach? What are your goals? What are the actual concrete stuff that you need to get done? What is the problem we are solving for ourselves? So let's imagine it's a five day sprint. So the very first thing, the very first day, I would start by, you know, what is the real, you know, what are the objectives in your work, in your project, in your business? Because this makes it that it's not just an exercise. So it's not like, like a workshop. It's not like a five day sprint, but actually we start with real problems, with real work. And you get the accountability I talked about. Uh, it, it's realistic. So it automatically becomes kind of important. Whatever you do, if you're solving real problems, if you're trying to reach real objectives, it becomes important. And then people, maybe if they have a lot of prejudice about design being this, you know, kids playing with colorful things and putting post-its on a wall, all of this kind of prejudice that design has, then it will afterwards show them that actually all this color and face paint really helps you solve real problems. So the point being, start with the real problems. Second step that I found very uh, effective is again something i said before the break introduce real people introduce real customers literally go and arrange i've done it many times if i've arranged real people real customers you know book their calendars why don't you come here and here and i will introduce you into this <laughs> meeting room and then people are ready to do interviews them and ask them and try to understand them because that's a really good way of, of showing that, hey, you, could, you should probably listen to the customers, that you kind of firsthand experience of hearing somebody telling about using their product or, or doing things in their life or you know, talking about their strategies. And that's actually how you get the empathy, seeing the other person's worldview. Get, get a real person there. If that person is a stranger, we all typically become somewhat empathetic towards them. And start saying, ah, oh, okay, what do they? I'm trying to look, how do they see this? That's a real potential customer for us. What do they say? What do they think? And that's how you kind of start breaking these prejudice about customer centricity as well. And remember, not meeting customers is so very easy. But why don't you just force them together very gently? So that would be step two: introduce real people, real customers. And then once you have kind of like day one, day two, once you have clarified that this is, these are the business goals, this is real stuff, we're really solving real things for you. And then you bring real people, real customers who they have to face as a human being. So they really get that, oh, wow, uh, this is the customers are real people and not like distant surveys, like somebody said in the chat. Then you, then they are, I'm sure they're ready to taste some of the creativity. Uh, let them play first. I would, I would definitely do it so. Just start with something playful, something fun, something that is not that serious as an exercise, you know, maybe brainstorming or, you know, role playing and, you know, writing narratives or writing dystopias of, you know, how things could go really bad for our company and, have people laugh, have them enjoy, have them relax with something that is not that important. And then, uh, because that, well, before going to the next step, is that why, why should we play a little? Is that we, again, you're trying to get the mindset right. And typical mindset issues for people when they are doing real work is you really try to get the mindset that we're actually 
you, this is something you need as a facilitator. You start seeing what is happening. That are people really solving problems? You know, when they're letting you, you're, you're making them try new tools and those creative stuff. Or are they just doing what is told? Are they waiting for somebody to tell that how this should be done? Are they waiting? Are they waiting for orders? Are they looking at their supervisor all the time before they do things? Uh, or are they doing what is expected of them? You know, getting that mindset right. And also you can start thinking about the mindset and, and helping people kind of like safety and risk taking. Are they making decisions? Are they doing the workshopping or whatnot to, because there is the highest paid person in the room? Do, do you need to eliminate their boss and then people start acting differently? Or, or are they trying to look for a consensus? I think that's a typical here in the Nordics. The problem is that when people get together, they're trying to find a solution that makes everybody happy, a consensus, but that's not necessarily the best solution for the customer now, is it? But anyway, you start introducing and look at how people dynamics go. Is there a team spirit? Is there psychological safety for everybody to raise their hands? Um, if you're asking them to change direction, pivot things, you know what, let's, let's, let's not focus on these customers. Let's focus on these customers. Are they willing to do that? How easy it for them? Are they looking for somebody to give a permission for that and so forth? And then the third kind of mindset issue as a facilitator, you should probably look at this stage is that just the basic energy levels and creativity. Um, are people thinking outside the box? I think you can see very quickly. Are they looking at things the same way they used to start looking at? And this is where the creativity comes in. Uh, if you do brainstorming, which is a kind of a good warm up, like I said, what's the number of ideas and how crazy are they? You can start looking at them. Or is it really difficult? They, they produce five ideas in an hour, or is it 500? And if you look at the ideas that are they kind of joking around and laughing, that are, are they, is there a feeling that they can be creative and laugh about these things? One night of sleep is typically a really good, literally a good uh, tool for you as a facilitator, that you let people go home and rest, and then you continue in the morning. So sometimes it's even better to have a workshop in the afternoon then let people go home and continue the next morning so that people can digest things and you're not pushing too much things in a condensed way and how people are you know talking to each other is it positive and constructive so these are the things you can do you know with exercises and making them play around or give them some kind of a fake case to work on because you're introducing a new tool and once you have kind of given them the creativity once you have managed to get them to laugh and joke and you know feel the kind of the relaxed creativity that you ideally is uh, then you hold on to that energy that positive energy and then you give them the real tasks then you give kind of the original problem and like hey remember day one you wrote down these real concrete problems now what if you solve these real problems, the same funny laughing way using these methods that you just used as an exercise. And that's typically where the magic happens. That's where they go like, ah, oh, okay. They just had this experience that they can, you know, joke about things, they can laugh about things. They don't have to be that serious. And then they take the real task and go like, hey, why not? Why don't I do this same thing? Why don't we together be more creative about this? Because we just had this experience of playing, playing with things. And then you, you know, reflection in the end. Uh, hold on to the initiative. If your workshop, your sprint has been successful, you have made these people do all of these things, make them hold on to this. Kind of like, hey, you had just a really nice experience. You learned a new tool, you know, you laughed while solving these actual real problems. Why don't you, what are you going to do now that the workshop is over, the sprint is over? What's going to happen next? How do you keep the momentum going? And here are a couple of tricks. Um, make everything beneficial. So not workshopping only exercises, but again, having real cases that makes typically beneficial. 
you can make it into a reality show, but they need to then tell others what they have been doing, which gives the good kind of social pressure. Have a follow up after a couple of weeks, see what did anything change? Was it easy for them to take the new tool or the method or thinking and so forth? And have those tools ready? No. Like there was in the chat, somebody shared a link to the management 3.0 tools. You know, have things like that go like, hey, here, here's the stuff. You know, the stuff we used in this workshop, it's I just sent an email which has everything in it. It's very easy for you to start using and so forth. And then kind of the final step after you have done all of this, you might actually tell them that, by the way, everything we did in these four days or five days or everything we did today in this workshop, some people call it design thinking. I don't know what you call it. <laughs> uh, maybe you call it customer centricity. Maybe you call it co-creation. You can call it whatever you want because it's your own thing. But if you go to the library, and check design thinking. You can find all of these excellent books and, and all of these videos and all of these tutorials that will help you even further into this thing that you kind of created yourself. And of course, the thing is that now it is their design thinking. It's not somebody coming up and saying like, buy this box of design thinking, but they actually created them for themselves with the context and the real problems they had themselves. So kind of summarizing my point here is that, again, the recipe, start with the real business objectives, bring in real customers. So bring in the reality in the beginning so that they say that this is actually real and whatever we do, it's probably beneficial. And then only the third step is the new stuff. And here I would definitely recommend, you know, forget the reality. Let's go and play around. Let's do some role play. Let's do body storming or whatever you know is the right thing to do here. And then introduce the tools. And now they can try out the tools and have a laugh. And then you keep that energy and then bring them back to the original task. And that's how they, you know, whether it's agile, whether it's lean startup, whether it's design thinking, that's that's the recipe to introduce the, to those people. But you can see that in this method that I'm introducing, the whole point is that you are actually really, you understand the philosophy, you understand the tools, you understand the methods a little bit deeper than on a surface level, because then you can talk about them without calling them design or agile or customer journey canvas or whatever. You really understand the tools and methods more than just the surface level. Well, this was my recipe, obviously. Uh, I'm sure there's different ways to approach this. Let's see if there's any comments here, except that, where's the attendance list? Well, I'm just gonna make a point. The attendance list kind of makes logic. It's logical, isn't it? That it comes towards the end of the lecture, does it? No, what's the point of having attendance in the beginning of the lecture? But I know people want to make sure they didn't miss the attendance. That's also important. Okay, wrapping it up for today, which means introducing the final exercise for you. Hey, we're asking you to facilitate the designing of a workshop. And deadline is again before next Wednesday. So here's what I'm asking you to do. So again, you get a pair, there's two of you. First, you know, start that one of you is the person A, the other is the person B, and then you switch roles. So person A, all of you need to think who are doing the exercise, think about a workshop that you probably need to do or would like to do. You know, This is asking that you think about, maybe it's your work, maybe it's your student life, maybe it's your hobbies, you know, come up with an idea that, you know, maybe, maybe you're coaching a junior soccer team. You know, maybe we should have a workshop on good defense or something like that. You know, but whatever is relatively familiar to you. And then design a workshop. And the other person is there to help you. And I have a lot of things for you to help out. So remember, start by thinking like this. Remember the temporal onion before, during, and after. You know, what's the preparation for the workshop? What are you going to do during the workshop? And what happens after the workshop? 
And each of these I have actually, as you can see, a long list of questions that you as a facilitator can help the other. Remember, this exercise, just like the previous ones, are actually about the facilitation. The workshop can be imaginary, uh, but have her as real as possible. That's, it makes everything much, much more interesting. But this is really about you facilitating the other person to do a really good workshop. So remember, it it's really should be beneficial for you both. And here's a you know here's my list of what to, what are the questions to ask before you start designing a workshop or a sprint, if you will. Uh, stuff like this: Who's taking part? Why are they there? You know, enough customer knowledge. Who will take the initiative? Where does it fit in? All of this kind of bringing all the things we have been talking about into one context. Then, of course, you need to design what happens during the workshop. So here's a, actually a copy paste of a five day design sprint I did many years ago. So each day has a theme for each day. I have, you know, why, why this step? Why this step? What's the outcome for each day? What are the tools and methods we're going to use? What are the risks? of this day not going as planned. And that's really planning the during, you know, how are we going to run this? And you can think about as a, as a one day workshop, obviously then you don't necessarily have five different steps. You maybe have one or two steps, but you get the point. And then of course you need to, during the workshop, you know, the fundamentals, how many hours are you going to spend? How many participants are you going to have? What is the objective? Uh, what are their expectations and so forth and so forth. If you're having a workshop, is it going to be mostly people giving lectures and talks or are they going to work hands-on? Uh, are they going to do them stuff themselves or are they going to share things with each other and so forth? Scheduling breaks, what's the actual space that you're going to use and so forth. And then adding here just to help you out is Yari's checklist about uh, Facilitation in general, these are questions that you should probably, you know, go over and think about how do you make the workshop good. And then the last checklist is about what happens afterwards. You know, did the workshop help achieve the bigger impact? Remember, the workshop in itself isn't valuable. The workshop probably helps something happen. So let's say it's the soccer football defense workshop for the 15 year olds. The impact is not the workshop. The impact is the next game that their defense is much better. That's the impact, remember that. Did the participants change anyway? How are you gonna measure that? Are you gonna have a follow-up? You know, how did, if, if it was a concept workshop, if you were trying to build something new, you know, what changed and so forth. Uh, and that's your job. That's the final kind of crown jewel, if you will, of this course, is to really help another person design a workshop. You're going to facilitate the other person to design a workshop. And the other person, you know, it can be junior football. It can be, you know, information security sprint. You don't know. And you're not an expert. But now you are an expert on facilitation. You can start helping them to do a really good workshop, even if you have no idea what's the actual domain and uh, the contents that they will be talking about. So remember, facilitate your page work. Person A, you know, you're in charge of planning the one-day workshop. With that, with that person B, your job is to be the facilitator. And the final reflection, reflections that we're asking you you know, first reflect alone maybe for five minutes and then discuss with your pair. What did you learn? Remember, you have two roles. You are the facilitator and the person being facilitated. It's really important that, you know, if you are facilitating me, then I will tell you that, okay, how was the experience of being facilitated? As well as you reflecting on your own facilitation. Good. Uh, getting close to the end. Next week, we're going to wrap up the whole thing. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about meta skills and roles and so forth. Don't jump ship quite yet. 
There's a lot of tools. I put the Lean Service Creation Toolbox over here, the one that me and my colleagues at Futurist have made. There's the Business Model Canvas, Value Proposition Canvas, if you haven't. And then actually, I think many, already two, three years ago, this was three years ago, it was the pandemic. So in 2020, we had a handful of companies. We kind of, you know, curated together a bunch of tools that are available. So have a look at that link as well. Uh, free tools for facilitation and leadership and so forth. Uh, that's it. And then last but not least, Christina is asking only the reflections, not the whole plan. Um, you can send the plan as well. Well, yeah, do send the plan as well. Uh, that we can actually kind of see that what you have been doing. But make no mistake, the reflections are the thing. This is all about reflecting on the facilitation. This is what the course is about. Uh, I'm not going to look deeply into what kind of workshops you did. I'm not going to give feedback on those workshops. I'm going to put my time and energy into the facilitation reflection. Good, thanks for asking. Well, that's it, your checklist attendance form. It's right there. Thank you, Rosa. And uh, everything will go to medium. You will get your hairs pretty quickly. And then last week to go. Mm.